Okay, so the recording has started. So this is our first lecture. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Yang Ye. Uh, I'm a lecturer of psychology in the School of Human Sciences at the University of Greenwich. And that's my email. I, I realized I forgot to include an email in the course outline. So, but that's the email that you can reach me, y.ye at gre.ac.uk. So, a uh, little bit about myself. Uh, I am a, I did my PhD in social psychology in, uh, at Western University, Canada. Uh, I did a, then afterwards I did the postdoc in experimental psychology at Ghent University, Belgium. A postdoc in sociolinguistics at Queen Mary University of London. And now I'm a lecturer in psychology at the University of Greenwich. So I'm, I'm, I was born in, uh, in China and went to Canada for my, for my PhD. And uh, my own research focused on some basic topics in social psychology, including attitudes, uh, stereotypes, prejudice and bias, and uh, implicit measures that looking at the, auto, the automatic forms of these attitudes and stereotypes, as opposed to explicit, explicit self-report uh, self measures that you just did on the Mentimeter quiz, uh, why those explicit measures looking at more controlled forms of attitudes, okay? My current project uh, that I'm working on has to do with accent bias, and another project has to do with gender stereotyping in, in the courtroom. So, not sure if this is still like, I would, write, 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 I would like to do this little bit introduction round of everyone, but I'm now wondering how can we do it? So, uh, we have, let me see, we have 21 participants and doing a, a round of introduction is going to take, probably going to take quite long. So, I'm going to skip that for now, but I will try to I'll send you an email afterwards and say, see if you can do a brief introduction through email to me, and we'll do something in the next lecture. Okay, how about that? And so the lectures would take the format of a two 50 minute 50 minutes lecture, have 10 minutes in between uh, break in between, and we're hoping to have a practical seminar where you can uh, practice. The, the how to's about about uh, quantitative data, mostly data analysis, uh, data visualization, that kind of thing, tasks. Uh, the software that we're about to use, now, uh, first of all, uh, we're gonna, gonna use Excel. Uh, and the thing about Excel that I found out today is that we cannot, it's because I'm using the, the Office 365 from the university. I don't know about you, but I'm that's what I'm using. And I found out that I cannot use, I cannot add any add-ins to, to the uh, to this university subscription of the uh, Windows of Office 365. And so, so it turns out that to do some analysis in Excel, you need this add-in called, uh, called analytical toolkit or something. So Excel is, is kind of, it's gonna be a little bit tough. Uh, we still use Excel for some basics like calculations and kind of stuff, but for any additional analysis, we have to de decide what kind of statistical software we're going to make, we're, we're going to use. We, we have some, we can use some online stats tools, but that's going to, again, uh, depends on internet, depends on everything that creates additional difficulties. So I, I want to ask you this, so if, if, so because the default used to be SPSS, but I'm not sure if everybody have access to it. 
So can you let me know, do you have access on SPSS? Just say yes or no on chat to give me an idea. Okay, so if you, okay, not, but you can get. Some of you say yes. Okay. Don't know, don't know. Don't have it yet. Okay, okay. So it's not for free. It's uh, but university should have SPSS license because in my university they have license for all the staff members and for for students. But I don't know if that's the case for all universities. Okay, so. But an, an uh, a alternative to SPSS is this thing called uh, JS, JASP, like JSP, and that is a free software. And I know that's it's been developed uh, for f for a few years, and nowadays it seems to be have very decent functions about that you, uh, decent functions for the analysis for some of the basic analysis that we are going to run. So if you don't, if not everybody have SPSS. We can just use the JASP, okay? So all you have to do is just Google JASP and download JASP. So we'll, we'll talk about that later and during the first lecture and the second lecture because in the first lecture we're just using Excel, okay? All right. And for those with some kind of experience, you can start try to use R, uh, but it's not for everyone, especially if you don't have any experience with stats or any kind of programming language, because R is a uh, uses script based language. It's, it's, it's like a script script based, so you have to type in all the scripts. And uh, last year, I started by trying to introduce R to people, and which turned out to be really difficult for a lot of people who don't have any experience with this kind of script based computing la uh, programming language. But if you are more have some kind of experience already, you can definitely uh, I would def definitely re recommend R, which is for free. Uh, all you have to do is just, just install something called R Studio. So a lot of this part of the uh, this course content comes from this online course called called a uh, statistical reasoning, and this is offered by a uh, Conic uh, Mellon University. And the Stanford University, all you have to do is the uh, Google st Statistical Reasoning, and it's completely free. And it's a, it's an excellent online course. It's it's absolutely brilliant for those who have no experience with the statistical uh, statistics, and uh, it focuses on the fundamentals of statistics. So I highly recommend you to sign up for the course and do it on, at your own pace. I myself find it very helpful, actually, after even many years of supposedly learning st about statistics to go back to this course. And I, I use this course to, to, to prepare my, because uh, I teach introduction to, to research methods in psychology. And I have to go, had to go back to this course and remind myself of some of the basic principles of statistics. So, so today's lecture, we are talk, we're going to give an overview about, about quantitative research okay? and with a, with a specific focus on uh, theories and the hypothesis. And then we will just dive into the concept of distribution. Uh, by distribution, we mean the distribution of values of a single variable. We will talk about what are variables, what type of variables are we going to focus on, and we'll do some work on how to depict the distribution of a single variable with uh, graphs. Okay? I was going to ask you to take attendance, so if you can go to Menti, uh, let me just go to menti.com first to, to make sure that I'm on that page.
Okay, so now if you go to the same menti.com, you don't even have to, if you were in the previous page, now you should be able to see this new, the new, uh, a new survey that asks you to put in your name and your uh, email. Okay, so if you could just put in your name and email, then that, that would be great. So because that's that gives me a, a list of all everybody's emails, so I can establish some, some kind of a contact with everyone. Okay. Okay. So uh, yeah, you can take your time on that. And because the page stays on. So let's talk a little bit about this quantitative data, right? So, uh, or the current situation, as I call it. I mean, one thing that COVID 19 really did, I don't know if everybody, is anybody like really feel strongly, like reject, uh, don't want me, want me to talk about COVID 19, please let me know. Because I feel that. This is a great opportunity for, for for data science because you see all these debriefings every day, like right? government debriefing every day, where you they present these kind of data in terms of charts and in terms of numbers to everyone, to every household in the UK. Right? So uh, it is, if anything, a, a kind of I don't know, like scientific propaganda to everyone reminding everyone how important science is, right? So we see all these data popping up every day in terms of numbers, for example, and we see these charts, right? So these charts come from the government and we see charts of total number of cases and daily number of lab confirmed cases and we kind of get the idea of how, from these charts, we get an idea of how the pandemic is going, how the situation is. And this is another chart showing that how the number of cases by age and sex, and you can see that at the X axis, they divided people into cases into their age groups, okay? And on the, on the y axis is the number of cases, which is frequency. And they use two, type, two tones of colors to indicate male and female. So, this is a, a straightforward data visualization that are easy to understand and also very important. And from, from this graph, for example, you can already ask questions. Right? For example, you would notice that uh, it seems to me that. Like across a lot of age groups, there are more female cases than male cases. And if you look at a 90 plus group, there, there are way more female cases than male cases. So you ask yourself why it is the case, then you realize at the same time, it might be the case that the average age of women, like the, 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 the age that women lives up to, is higher than the men. So men have a higher mortality mortality rate in general. So it could be the case that there are just less people, less male than females in the 90 plus group, right? So the, the, what I'm saying here is that uh, the data, the visualized data presents you with some information and also presents you with opportunities to ask research questions based on these observations. And here's another uh, graph that's a little bit more complicated. And this is the, uh, so first of all, if you look at the title, you will see that this is the estimation of the reproduction number R. You probably have heard that, that number because now the UK is like the, the, the latest speech by Boris Johnson on a Sunday evening brought out this number R, right? So we know that this is called the reproduction number we know that higher numbers means that uh, it reproduces faster, the virus. And so this is in Germany as of uh, the May of the 10th, right? So, uh, on the, on, so uh, for any graph, we look at what exactly uh, is the x-axis mean and what exactly does the y-axis, which is the uh, vertical axis, 
axis mean, right? So the, the x-axis here is date, right? So it's a, it's a time series study, a time series data. And we also have on the y-axis is the value of r. And you can see that on across the 1.0 of the y-axis, there's a red line, right? Which suggests that uh, we basically there, it's, it's a very sensitive and threshold value that's very important. That's why they mark it there. Right? And on the vertical line, uh, on the x-axis, you see multiple uh, straight vertical lines, the, the green lines, that indicates what happened in during that time period, right? You can see that when major events canceled, the R started to, to the R was was rising before before the 15th of, of, of March. And then as major event canceled, it dropped. Merkel calls for avoiding social contacts, shop are closed, and then some went around the end of March, it dropped below one. And it stayed at below one. But now you can see that uh, recently it, it seems to be going above one again, okay? And you can see towards the right-hand side of the, the graph, it says newest value 1.13, which is an estimate of R. And you can also see some information called a 95%, 0 0.94 to 1.35. And you can see some kind of a shade between this solid line, right? There's a little bit of shade between the solid line around it. So what, what exactly is that, right? So it's called 95%. And there seems to be some kind of estimation, right? And it seems to me a, it's a range of values that range from 0 0.94 to 1.35, which is the latest value. But what exactly is that, right? So, uh, and then on, on, on the top we see it's the shade has the label called a 95% confidence interval. Okay? So what, what exactly is confidence interval? This is something that we'll be learning in this, in this course. And also, some of you might ask the question, what exactly is R? Because R is just a number, it's just a measure. But what exactly does it mean? So, so here's the, some information from Public Health England. So it says the R is the reproduction number, okay? If it's below one, then on average, each infected person will infect fewer than one other person. So, so this, and the, the lower the R, the faster the infections will fall, okay? When R is above one, it means that infection is accelerating. Okay. The higher the number, the faster it spread through the population. So in the previous slides, we see that R can take different values. And on this, on here, it gives meaning to those values. Right? By meaning, I mean that it, it associates those values to some kind of a real life event. Okay? So this is what's also uh, it's an important concept, is that the R itself is just a, a number, a, a measure of something. And it can take different numerical values, and the value it takes can, can be mapped onto some kind of a real life event. Okay? So this is something to keep in mind as you go on through the course. So the Public Health England also talked a little bit more about R. It says the current value of R in England standards 0.75 which according to what we read before, is great because it's below zero, okay? But interestingly, it also says, the R ranges from the lowest value in London to the highest in Northeast and Yorkshire. So which means that there's some kind of variation across different regions. So first of all, R can not only be calculated for England, it can, can also be calculated for London, for Northeast, or for Yorkshire, by each region. Okay? The second is that the R, the value of R, seems to be vary. Okay, from the previous graph, we see that it varies according to, uh, across time, but at the same time, the R value can also vary 
according to regions. So different regions might have different values of R. And the next sentence says, the difference in R number can be explained by the timing of, of the initial wave of infection. This suggests that this kind of variation is interesting and needs to be explained by another factor, right? So it says that the R, that this kind of variation is actually due to different, different factors. So now we are trying to establish some kind of relationship between the R number, between the variation of the R number across different region, regions, and some other factors that we don't know yet. Okay. So the key theme here is that there's some kind of a variation in this number, okay, in this in this measure. And this variation can be explained. Okay. So the third thing is that how is R calculated? Because R is, is a measure, we have to know, like if we really want to know what it actually says, it is helpful to us to know and how about how it is calculated, right? So Public Health England also said that R uses daily COVID-19 confirmed death data and information about the risk of dying at the time from infection to death. And it's calculated using some method called H stratified regional transmission models, which I don't know what it is, which is known as some kind of a statistical mathematical model. Fine. And, but uh, here's something that I want you to pay attention to is what exactly the R is doing. Uh, first of all, uh, it, it reconstructs the number of new COVID-19 infections over time. So which means that uh, by this data analysis that they're doing can, can go back on time and, and reconstruct the past to give it a better picture of how COVID-19 developed over the, over the time. It can estimate a measure of ongoing transmission, which is R, okay? So it provides the R value, but it can also predict the future. It can, 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 can be used to predict the number of new deaths in different regions and age groups. Okay, so this single, this data analysis that's, that's being conducted can be used to reconstruct, reconstruct the past and to predict the future and to, to, to describe the current situation, right? So what do we know about the R so far? First of all, it is a measure. It is a measure can take numerical values. And it seems that the 1.0 is a key threshold, okay? But not only uh, it can take values, but the values can actually mean something that's happening in the real world. And that's really important. The second thing is that it has been estimated using some empirical data and the mathematical models. Okay. The third key fact, the key, key message here is that there's some kind of variation in the R. The variation can happen between regions and time. And explaining such variations seems to be very, seems to be possible and important. Right? We want to know what influences R, and therefore in the future we can control R better. Right? So this is just, just one of the many examples of how quantitative data is being used in the real world and how it affects policy and decision making and people's activities, right? And pandemics happens to be a, a discipline or, or area in the medical uh, discipline that is heavily relying on quantitative data analysis and modeling to to trying to predict what would happen in the real world. Yeah. Okay. So now I'm going to give you a, a brief overview about what we call quantitative research. Uh, some key, key topics here. The first is the research paradigm, right? such as how do we ask the questions? How do we come up, come up with a hypothesis? Which is a very key, really, uh, the, the central concept of the entire research paradigm is the hypothesis. And how do we uh, 
plan for data collection and test these hypotheses, which is the question of research design. How do we decide whose data do we collect, which is a, a, a question of sampling and the issue of measurement and how our real life phenomenon, such as the spread of the virus, turn into numerical values. So these are questions about the research paradigm, what I call. And the other, as, uh, the other part, key topic, has to do with data analysis and statistics. And in fact, this will be 80% uh, of what the course will be about. Okay, because, because during this data analysis, you also constantly reminded of issues of the research paradigm. Okay, so uh, data analysis, including uh, first of all, you want to describe and depict the data using graphs or numbers. Uh, the second is statistical inference, which means that we want to try to infer from a smaller sample to, to a bigger population. Okay? And the third is hypothesis testing, and how do we analyze the data in a way that tests these hypotheses that we define in the research design and turn those and draw conclusions. So these are the, the two key topics. And if you look at the course outline, which is which I'm not going to bring up at the moment, it, it is shared in the uh, in the in the Microsoft uh, team space. And uh, I'll email you the, a copy later. And you you notice that most of the con the mod, most of the course focus on data analysis and statistics. And we'll go back to the we we, we will I will. Uh, quickly have an overview of the research paradigm in, the lec in this lecture, and we'll come back to it in the last two lectures. Okay? But the most part of the, of the course will be, will be data analysis and, and statistics. So this is the process of quantitative research. Let me see how much time we have. Um, I'll try to give you the, a, a quick example, and then we'll take a break. So the process can be summarized as such. Uh, first of all, you, you will be asking research questions, and that can be from observation, right? Or that can be from reading, or just out of curiosity. But then you will do your literature search and develop some hypothesis. And then is the, uh, the, the process of, of turning these abstract concepts and hypotheses into operationalizable data or some kind of uh, plan of data collection. Okay? And then you collect data, analyze data, and interpret the results, and you'll draw your conclusions. A quick example. So uh, let's say that uh, a while ago, uh, people have been stockpiling, right? And, and people have stopped doing that, but uh, they, they were doing that at the beginning of the pandemic. So observation is that it, it happens, and it, it, is, it's, it gives, some pe uh, gives a, lot of, a lot of people who are not stockpiling a lot of problems, right? It's, it creates some kind of cognitive dis cognitive dissonance, that why are these people doing that, these people are idiots, that kind of things. So, so based on this, let's say like I, I, come, up, I come up with this research question that, because uh, I'm a psychologist, so I'm, I'm interested in how can we uh, reduce stockpiling, right? So what, what would be uh, an effective psychological intervention, right, that reduces stockpile during a crisis? So that's my research question. Then uh, assume that I go on a literature search and read about theories about stockpiling, right? Or uh, as there are theories about why people panic buy, for example. So it, it comes down to how people what, how people see things and how people feel. Okay? So uh, the people might see shortage, right? So they, they, there might be a threat of things being unavailable, toilet paper being unavailable in the near in the foreseeable future. They might perceive value because they can profit from the situation, or they also perceive what other people are doing. Uh, if other people are buying a lot, it creates some kind of a norm that you, you're, you're kind of, people follow norms, right? Especially under uncertain situations. They also might feel panic, right? They feel some kind of arousal when, because they detected there's an emergency. And also uh, people feel that things are out of their control, right? So it is perhaps that uh, stockpiling is a way of them regaining control. 
So, so let's say that I want to focus on the, the control bit of things, right? So now I want to develop this hypothesis that if I boost people's sense of control, that can reduce stockpiling. Okay, so that becomes a more specific hypothesis that I will further turn into more specific hypothesis that can be tested uh, in, in empirical research. So uh, first of all, I want to operationalize the sense of control. I want to think about how I'm going to either manipulate people's sense of control or how I'm going to measure people's sense of control. And also I'll have to think about what, what I call dependent variable, which I will talk about later, uh, is uh, the stockpiling behavior. So, so how am I going to measure people's stockpiling behavior, right? I can go out there in the store and actually measure people how much people are buying, but that will be very difficult, right? So in psychology, we tend to not focus on the actual behaviors because everybody knows actual behaviors are very difficult to measure. I'm not saying that they don't, they don't do that, because, but it's very difficult. And if you actually have actual behavior measured in a study, that's considered a high quality. But usually I can measure uh, their intentions to stockpile, right? I can have people fill in out a questionnaire about how much you want to stockpile, okay? So that's easier because you don't have to be in at a store to observe what's actually happening. So now that uh, I have to think about research design, right? So this, again, remind you, design is about how am I going to collect this data so that it can, the data can be used to answer my research question, to test the hypothesis. So there are two, two broader uh, categories of research design. One is experiments, right? So in experimental design, I'm saying I'm thinking that okay, I have to come come up come up with some kind of intervention. So uh, so if so one potential way is is to have people to make some plan, right? So if, if planning can increase people's sense of control, so if that's the case, if sense of control is is what forces people to drives people to stockpile, then I can have people make a plan and hopefully that regains them their sense of control and reduces the, reduces the stockpiling behavior. So, uh, so an experiment, what usually happens is that I randomly assign participants into one of two groups. So I have an experimental group and I have a control group. And in experimental group, I ask people to do uh, make a plan what they're going to do during the pandemic using a to-do list. And in the control group, I have some kind of control task that doesn't involve planning, right? So they have to write down something, but not planning. So I can ask them to write down their thoughts about the pandemic or their feeling at the moment, okay? And then afterwards, I measure their stockpile intention uh, using some kind of questionnaire. So like, how much do you want to stockpile? Now the hypothesis that for this experiment, okay, so is that there will be lower levels of stockpiling intention in the experimental group compared to the control group. So notice that this hypothesis itself, I mean, this is a quantitative study, but the hypothesis itself is not really, doesn't really include any numerical values, right? Instead, it's, it's like some kind of a categorical statement that's saying that A will be higher than B. So the magnitude of, of, of stockpiling will be different between the two groups. And it doesn't say how much is gonna be different, right? And this is very typical for a lot of the social science and special psychology. We have this kind of not so precise hypothesis so-called quantitative, but if you look at the verbal statement itself, the statement itself, it's, it's, it's categorical, qualitative in nature, right? So A will be higher than B, right? There are other disciplines like physics who are able to make much more precise predictions because uh, their measurement and their theories are just much more precise. Okay, make sense? Uh, for example, uh, they, they will be able to make point estimations about what's the ratio, like how, how long does it take for the Earth to orbit the sun? And they will be able to make measurements, multiple observations, and they will be able to see if the, the value that they observed actually fits the, prediction, the, the predicted value or not. And even a tiny bit of, of, the, of, of the diversion can be considered as very interesting for a theoretical breakthrough, and that's physics, okay? Uh, I don't know which, and for uh, pandemic, for example, they're also trying to make more precise numerical predictions 
about how many people are going to die, but we know that that's also that's far less precise compared to what can be achieved in physics. Still more precise than than, than in psychology. This kind of a hypothesis, uh, but there will be a they can say okay about between ten thousand to five hundred thousand people are going to die, but you will be able able to to test that because a lot of things will change between making a prediction and as it happens in the next three months, especially the, if the phenomenon that you're studying depends on human behavior. So that's that. So we can also do some kind of correlational design. Uh, so this is another type of research design that doesn't really assign participants randomly into two groups. So in the correlation, correlational design, we basically measure the their subjective sense of control, for example, through one questionnaire and the stockpiling intention in another questionnaire. And the hypothesis will be uh, the higher levels of sense of control, the lower levels of stockpiling intention there will be. So as you can see, this is another kind of uh, very, uh, I could call it categorical uh, statement about if the sense of control goes up, stockpiling is gonna go down, okay? But also, you can notice that in this hypothesis, there involves two uh, variables, right? One variable is subjective sense of control. The other variable is uh, stockpiling intention. So this is this kind of hypothesis is basically describing the relationship between two variables in very categorical terms, like higher, lower, that kind of terms, right? So in the previous uh, experimental example, we are also looking at uh, the variable of intervention, right, on stockpiling intention. Uh, it's just that uh, this variable here is not a new. Uh, it is. It is not a uh, what we call. It. It's a bit different from the variable of uh, uh, that you get from a questionnaire. Instead, uh, we we give experimental group a one, and the control group a zero. Okay, so it's still numerical representation of the, the group membership. So this intervention variable is what we call a categorical variable that we can use one and zero to indicate. The value of the variable, right? So again, this hypothesis deals with categorical judge statement about the relationship between variables. Okay, so this is the nature of this kind of hypothesis. So these are just some example example questions that I might put into these questionnaires. How much do you feel like in control right now? How much do you want to stockpile? I don't feel like I don't have any control. I want to stockpile. Right? So that. So that's the research process, and uh, really, uh, before moving on to uh, plan and collecting data, that that's about it. And that, that's that. There it is. Uh, and in the next step, in the next section, I will talk about a little bit more about the philosophical aspect of this approach, what we call the hypothetical the deductive approach to the empirical science. But right now, let's just take a, a quick break and come back at uh, five after one. That's okay. I'm going to stop, pause the recording, and go have a tea or have some music. Uh, I'll see if I can bring my cat. And I'm, if I stop recording, I'm going to stop recording right now. Record it. Want to stop? Stop recording.